the few things to talk about is that it's spooky season. Yeah, you're especially attached to Halloween because you are a figurehead in a Halloween based uh, genre of. That's generous, but I'll take it. Yeah. What I used to think were children's cartoons, but I guess is now just not. They were all ages cartoons, not children's cartoons, all ages cartoons. Okay. Scooby-Doo. And now they're making an adult Scooby-Doo. This one's not for the kids, Tristan. Okay. This one's for the This one's for the ever boys. for the kids. Like, yeah. when are they going to make a Batman movie that kids like? Instead of like Batman getting even darker and uh, more grim, they did. It's called Lego Batman. Okay, yeah, that, and that it one came slapped. out not too long ago. So, jokes on you. Like, what do kids get anymore? Like, all the superheroes are now grim, dark. Yeah. Well, they're offsetting it too, right? So, Scooby Doo used to be all ages, I feel, and now they're like, let's take it from everyone, and we're gonna do ones for the adults. And one's for the little babies, because they're also doing Scooby-Doo and the Mystery Pups, which is like a their version of Blue's Clues. Um, so we got a little baby one and a big, gruesome, dark, gritty. This one's for the this one's for the parents. The other one's for the That's kids. That's gonna cause some confusion because like what if a kid like I really like this pup show, and this is another Scooby-Doo show. Ah, uh, so but here's the here's the thing. The Velma show, the dark gritty Velma show can't use Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo is not in that show. So it's not even called like Scooby-Doo presents Velma or anything like that, right? I don't even think Velma's in the other, in the Mystery Pups. So like- Oh, the, the, so the Mystery Incorporated has uh, has divorced. <laughs> Something like that. I don't know what the deal is with the Mystery Who Pups. Who got the machine in the divorce? <laughs> That's the big question. Everyone always is like, who owns the Mystery Machine? And I'm like, it's complicated, Okay. It depends on the continuity that you're asking. Listen, it's a shaggin' wagon that yeah. is um, that is painted in psychedelic colors. That is Shaggy's goddamn car. It's sometimes it is Shaggy's car, right? It is Shaggy's car to the extent that he probably he sleeps in it. He's probably the one who sleeps in yes. it. Yes, I mean in the in the live action Scooby Doo movies, when the gang does break up, Shaggy and Scooby get the mystery machine. Other interpretations say it's Fred's car. Other other interpretations say that it's Velma's parents' car that they all painted or whatever. So like it depends. It's just, stop asking me the car. Who cares Listen, about the car? We all knew the guy who sold you weed out of his Volkswagen bus. Uh huh. Who had a dog that was far too big for that van? Yes. I, we all knew this person in college. So like, I think it's very obviously Shaggy's car. Look, maybe one day I'll make a video. Maybe one day very soon I'll make a video that's just called like, who owns the mystery machine? And I'm just going to put it to bed. And I'm just like, stop asking me about the car. It's the least interesting part <laughs> of the Scooby-Doo <laughs> franchise. Stop asking me about the car. The thing is, if there's anything I know about Scooby-Doo, which is not much because I haven't watched a whole lot of it, uh -huh. but uh, most of the time, the service they provide. Yeah. There should be a point where it's like, it turns out that they're just being hired by like insurance companies to find oh, people who are trying to put in fake claims. Oh, that's good. What if the biggest sort of like conspiracy with Mystery Inc. is they're not being hired to find false claims. Rather, they are helping set up the false claims so that they get paid for it. And then they put the, all the people that, you know, they hire, they'll get some money on the side. I mean, they still go to jail, I guess. Are you going to prison? <laughs> the criminals still go to jail. So it's not a sweet deal for them but otherwise mystery incorporated it's like all right you're gonna be a ghost we're gonna catch you it's gonna be great for us it's gonna be less great for you but we'll make i don't know we got it's an extremely extremely funny way to set up uh doing like massive insurance fraud yeah <laughs> it's all yeah that's pretty good so that's all to say um this episode's coming out for the halloween episode yes Ooh, are you dressing up at all for Halloween? Yes. We have a family costume oh. uh, that we are doing. We are all... Oh, dear God. You don't have to say it. Everyone who thought I was this super cool, suave guy is going to be very disappointed. Everyone. We all got Starfleet uniforms. Okay. Not to give anything away, but my son's name is a bit of a Star Trek joke. Oh. I don't even know if I knew that. I'll, I'll tell you after the show. Okay. But uh, it's a bit of a Star Trek reference. And so we were like, you know, we, we, we did the uniforms. And so we got him like a little... Captain Kirk 1960s yeah. uniform. Okay. And my wife got like the early 1990s, like uh, Voyager uniform. Oh, nice. And I got for myself 
uh, the one that I've always been wanting, the late 1990s Dominion War first contact gray shouldered <gasps> uniforms. Oh, now that's I'm, a good one. I don't know one. if you know any of these. No, I know I know some of these. I know First Contact. Okay. First Contact's a great movie. So you know the 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 gray shoulder uh, uniforms? Absolutely. Always loved those. Oh, I've they're great. One. They're amazing. Do you know the Voyager one? No, I've not seen Voyager. Uh, have you seen uh, early seasons D Space Nine? No, I'm sorry. I've only seen Next Generation and a little bit of the original series. Okay, so you might have missed that one. I did. But either way, that's that's what we're doing. Uh, we're not going anywhere. Uh, we're just going to hand out candy. Okay. Which uh, will be interesting because we also live on sort of a dead end street. And last year was during COVID. So we like bought a bunch of candy and like six kids showed up. Mm. But hopefully this year will be better. <laughs> hopefully this year's better. Yeah. I wonder if all the young kids are into Star Trek. Maybe you're, you'll get some attention that way. Be like, we've got candy and Star Trek outfits and uniforms. Also, I have a feeling that by the time the kids actually go out to do trick-or-treating, the baby's going to be in sleep. <laughs> oh, that's also true. <laughs> yeah, he goes to bed at like 7 o'clock. So it's like, yeah. That's fair. I have a, I've got a, a costume that I'm doing as well. Emily and I do couples costumes. Last year, we were Superman and Lois Lane. That was very fun. This year, speaking of... What was your uh, Lois Lane costume like? It was... So I had my... I had like a, you know, like a little uh, overcoat sort of thing. Like a little... I was... No, I wasn't Lois Lane. You should have done that. That would have been That would have been good. No, I, this year we are doing... Speaking of Scooby-Doo, we're doing a pretty good... And I'm not going to spoil it. You'll have to follow me on... I'm plugging early. You'll have to follow me on the internet on my Twitter and Instagram to see it. But we're going to do, there's a little teaser for you. We're going to do a mystery solving dog and his best pal. That's going to be our couple's costume. So you're going to have to go oh, see. Wow, you're finally going to do Scrappy Doo and Fred? <laughs> Scrappy <laughs> and Fred. Those are the two characters that we're going to do. And you have to guess who's going to be who. Me and Emily, who's going to be Scrappy, who's going to be Fred. And whichever way you guess, I promise you're wrong. So figure that one out. Uh, <laughs> um, aliens? Um, oh. I have heard of something about aliens. Yeah, here I can segue uh, from Scooby-Doo to aliens. Boy, speaking of uh, Scooby-Doo related stuff, they had a movie about the, called the Alien Invaders, which had aliens in it. And this is a show about aliens. This podcast we're going to do. This is a podcast. Hi, everyone. Hi, how's it going? This is a oh, podcast. Oh, yeah, we're doing a podcast. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is a podcast called It's Probably Not Aliens, where uh, we look into ancient astronaut theory and the History Channel show Ancient Aliens, and we look at their silly little uh, pseudo-archaeology, pseudo-science, pseudo-history, and we debunk it while explaining the real-world history behind people and places and things that are really cool and we think you should know more about. And my name is Scott Nicewander. I know nothing. I usually come to this podcast extremely unprepared. And this time my body is unprepared because I'm still sick from my illness earlier. There's a chance that some of these episodes might air out of order. So you might hear me go from very sick to perfectly fine to back to being sick. So we'll see how that goes. You just like coming back. My name is Tristan. I, I do the terrible things that make the episodes happen. In the relay race of this show, I do all the work until we record, and then Scott picks up after we record. Yeah, that's fair. I do stuff. I do less stuff now that we have an editor. You post the show. That's true. You run the Twitter because you know how to relate to humans in a way that I can't. It's an alien experience for you, one would say. Yeah. So today's episode is going to be fun because it's our Halloween special. Special. Um, it's actually what happened was is that I planned for our next episode mm. to be our Halloween special. Right, right. And then I was researching this one to come out on November 1st. And I think that you and the internet will agree that this episode this is a good one being a Halloween episode because it has to do with the origin of the jack o' lantern <gasps> uh, is a lot better. Yes. And also for the next one, which is the day before the Mexican Day of the Dead, is an episode on the Grim Reaper, oh, which hitting... feels like it's also a better mm, fit. So mm, mm, mm. I was going to say get ready for but but like by the time you're listening to it, you're in it. You're in the spooky mood in the spooky season. I'm excited. I wish I was mm -hmm. you right now, listener. We're learning about the jack-o'-lantern today. Yes. How does that fit in with aliens? What's an alien theory about jack-o'-lantern? Do aliens have pumpkin heads? 
Well, this actually has um, the ancient aliens part has literally nothing to do with it. This is like uh, one of those ones where I heard about five seconds of ancient aliens uh, where they talked about this, where it was uh-huh. like this, this thing, is an alien. Yeah. Um, and then I go and do a ton of research to be like, oh, it's definitely not an alien, but it's a whole bunch of other cool stuff. OK, I think I've been spending the last like two or three months now just doing stuff on a single episode about like close encounters in the past. Don't you love how they can do that? (laughs) Don't you love how they can say something for five seconds of one of their episodes and they'll just be like, anyway, moving on. And then it will latch into your brain and you'll be like, no, I have to. No, we have to talk about this (laughs) for a whole hour. Luckily, uh, I can say that with the current list of episodes that I have put down, I have finished watching season one of Ancient Aliens. We did it! Once I do the like a dozen or so episodes, I think I still have. Actually, I bet the listeners will find this slightly amusing. Let me see. Let me open up my It's Probably Not Aliens Notion page because we're both big Notion heads. We're big Notion heads. That's the first time anyone's described my head as big, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I have uh, 13 episodes, 14 if you include the one after this one. And once all those are done, we are done with season one oh of my Ancient gosh. Aliens. So we'll be like in the 60s or 70s by that point. But yeah. <laughs> what an achievement. Well, the good news is, I mean, how many seasons could Ancient Aliens have? Good question. We'll find out whenever it gets canceled. (laughs) It's still going. But yeah, so today we're going to talk about this one point where they were talking. They're just listing off a bunch of people who saw UFOs. One, I'm still, you know, researching to try and see if I can find a real juicy bit to chew on to talk about. Sure. But this one uh, goes to a guy by the name of John Winthrop. John Winthrop. And that's a name that, you know, would go over a lot of people's heads. You know, this is John Winthrop, whatever. But then your boy here, Tristan, uh-huh. who has master's degrees in American uh, history. Here he goes. And American cultural studies. Uh-huh. And did three years of a PhD in American history. Sure. And I'm like, oh, John Winthrop, really? John Winthrop is a person who saw this? Interesting. Interesting. So yeah, John Winthrop is like, he's a Puritan. Okay. This is how old we're going. So not a recent character in history. No, no, no. This is how old we're going. This is a Puritan who was one of the founders of the, quote, Massachusetts Bay Colony. (laughs) So put some buckles on your head there. I sure will. So yeah, John Winthrop. (laughs) is who we're talking about today, reporting on an event that happened in 1639. So that was, uh, yeah, he was, he's an older person. Born okay. 1588, died 1649. Oh, so, 10 years before his death, he, he saw some aliens. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Okay. The story that Ancient Aliens comes from, where they're like, oh, look, this definitely an alien, comes from a writing that he did yes. that he reports from somebody else. So it's not even a firsthand account. No, no, no. All right. And I'm going to read you the account. Keep in mind, everybody, this is in semi-middle English, so it might sound a little weird. All right. But this is the account of John Winthrop. Give us your best rendition of this quote, like you're doing an elementary school play about the origins of Thanksgiving. I don't know why. We're doing a Halloween <laughs> episode, but you mentioned buckles on your hats. So we're kind of in that. the we're kind of in the Thanksgiving, uh the Thanksgiving. We're I don't know, we don't sphere. do, we just had Thanksgiving here in Canada. In Canada I know that American Thanksgiving's got a whole different, it's got some stuff with these guys. We're in the Thanksgiving range of time. Yeah, but like in Canada, we don't really do the like pilgrim story. So um, it's not part of our Thanksgiving. Oh, fair enough. All right. You know, I'm only aware of it because, uh, you know, I'm married to an American. And I, I am an expert in America stuff. Anyways, give, this is, give me this quote. Cool. All right. So, and, and just just listen to like how 17th century this is. In this year, one James Everell, a sober, discreet man, and two others, saw a great light in the night at Muddy River. This is uh, by the Charles River, by the way, uh, which is in modern-day Boston. Gotcha. When it stood still, it flamed up, and it was about three yards square. When it ran, it was contracted into the figure of a swine. It ran as swift as an arrow towards Charlton, Charleston today. Gotcha. And so up and down for about two or three hours... First of all, that was all two sentences. Excellent. This is my kind of writing. Yeah. They were come down in their lighter about a mile. And when it was over, they found themselves 
carried quite back against the tide to the place they came from. Divers other credible persons saw the same light after about the same place. Okay. Irrefutable. <laughs> Irrefutable. Not only was this challenging to parse from a modern English perspective, let me see if I can translate this. Tell me if I got it right, just based off of what I'm understanding. So James Everill, sober dude, wasn't drunk. Yeah, doesn't drink. Doesn't Puritans drink. cared a lot about that obviously, shit. Obviously, so not necessarily a trick of the mind in that regard. Discreet, which means he's not a guy who tells tall tales, basically. Doesn't discreet also mean that he's like one distinct individual? Like one discreet man. Yes, <laughs> one and not many. <laughs> yeah, he was one person. This James guy was one single human. He's definitely not three children <laughs> in a trench coat. <laughs> he's not three children in a trench coat. You've got to take his word for it. But there were two others with him. And so they saw this light over the river, or in the river? It says in. All right, they saw a light in the river. I'm just going off of it. It started, it became, it looked like a pig at some point. Probably a reference to it being like a ball shape or something like that. All know. right, yeah, like a big little pot belly, yeah. And then it ran towards the city, and then the, it would, and then it, it just, I, and then it just did that? And then other people saw it also? Yes. There's some other divers saw it. Also, they found that they were far away from where they originally set out after they witnessed this event. Okay. Unfamiliar territory. So this gets latched on by the UFO people because a lot of close encounter stories involve missing time and stuff like that. So they're like, oh, "Oh, this is a missing time because he mentioned that they found themselves in a different place later. Oh, I mean, I guess you could say that. Yeah. But then, yeah, then it ends with like also some other guys saw it. Yeah. (laughs) Also some like other dudes also. It's just it it reads like they're being like, so there was this guy named James, a sober, discreet dude, single person. It's like, um, what was that guy um, describing uh, how he found out about something in Ant-Man? Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Louise, I think. I can't remember. But it definitely feels like they're being like, they tell this whole story and they can tell the like the audience they're telling it to is like, I don't know. And he's like, but uh, but also there were like other people there who also saw the same thing. So, you know, take that. Plus, he was also a single person who was not drunk. He was, so. he, was he wasn't drunk. He was a single individual. Yeah. So ladies. So when I dug into this, I sat on this, this, this episode I planned on doing months ago, but I got this far and I was like, that's it? That's all this is? <laughs> all this, like, all right. Come on, buddy. And that's all they got. They, they saw this light. Yeah. So, so yeah, a more, so a more distinct version of what's going on here about the writing is that Winthrop writes that a sober, discreet man was rowing in a boat with two other guys on Muddy River, mm-hmm. which empties into a swamp, which is important to note for this story, okay. into the tidal basin of the Charles River. Gotcha. Uh, but then all of a sudden he saw a light. And according to the men, the light hovered and then flew at a high speed back and forth between their vessel and the city of Charleston, which is about two miles from where they were. Oh, that's what they meant when they said it went like so up and down for about two or three hours. I thought it meant literally up and down in the air like it was like moving. But they're saying like back and forth almost. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. As the men watched the light event, they then uh, got pushed about a mile by the tide. But when the light vanished, the men realized that they had returned to their original location, had no memory of rowing against the tide or dropping anchor, Mm. and speculated that the light somehow transported them back to where they started. They weren't the only witnesses to the UFO event either. According to Winthrop, quote, divers and other credible persons saw the same light. So that's basically the description. Yep, tacked that in right at the end. Uh, But then there were also other people who saw it. Yeah, so what I find very funny about this is that John Winthrop is like, a major figure in American history, um, sort of, yeah. um, if you know, early America, he wrote a book or he wrote a, uh, a speech pamphlet, something to that extent called a model of Christian charity. Okay. Which is one of the more founding texts in colonial American history and sort mm-hmm. of lies out a lot of wishes for what would become the American concept of liberty and freedom. Oh, you might know him best because he is the person who wrote the quote, uh, city upon a hill. Oh, which has been quoted by politicians all over the place. Like everyone from JFK to Sarah Palin has Mm. used the city upon a hill reference. The problem, though, is that he actually gets a little bit buried because one, he 
was born and died like a hundred years before the American Revolution. Yeah, so. the, I think he also gets buried because he did die. So that's typically die, what yes, you do yeah, with yeah. people. But also in the late 19th and early 20th century, critics really didn't like a lot of the way that he ruled in Massachusetts Bay, especially Nathaniel Hawthorne and H.L. Mencken, who uh, didn't like a lot of the fact that he was very Puritan and he did a lot of things that while they are kind of foundational in the idea of America, they were also basically theocratic authoritarianists. <laughs> um, okay. But because of his idea of specifically liberty, and we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about the American concept of liberty, he is considered, quote, a lost founding father in sort of modern reassessments of him, mm. that he is very important to the intellectual development of what would become the ideas behind the American Revolution. So that's like gotcha. the sort of big thing about him. He's like a, what's the other one? Button Gwinnett or something like that. Ooh, I don't know. I want to a history about. major here. Button I know, Gwinnett. I know. I, I don't know if I'm saying that last name right. He was like one of those like politicians who literally like lived long enough to like sign the Declaration of Independence and died the same night or something like that. Button Gwinnett. Yeah, yeah. Died 1777. <laughs> something like that. Yeah, I don't know much about this guy. Interesting though. He was, oh, he was the representative of Georgia, the Continental Congress. That makes sense. Okay. That sounds like something a guy named Button would be. Button. <laughs> what a good name, Button. That's how they name things of the day. We had to cut this because I spent the first like 10 minutes of this show thinking that it was Cotton Mather, not John Winthrop, because they also did this to Cotton Mather. And that's going to be a different episode of this podcast when I collect enough data on it. But yeah, Winthrop is known for having this concept of liberty. Now, when you think of liberty, what do you think of that? Like, what do you think that means in your head? I think liberty, I barely know her T. Perfect. Thank you. No notes. I guess liberty, it's, I I mean, I think of a big statue. I don't know. I, that's that's such a hard concept. For me, it's oh, it's almost in a weird way, like synonymous with freedom in a sense. But I know they're different. Yeah. I don't know. It's a complicated, it's, it's, it's a complicated term. Mm -hmm. So Winthrop's concept of it being a Puritan was that there are two types of liberty, one that's bad and one that is good. One is called natural liberty, which is the, the freedom to do what you wish to do with your life, which can be evil as well as good and he thought should be restrained. But he did believe in something called civil liberty, which was the liberty to do good things, to do what he quote, the proper and object of authority which means it's the kind of freedom where you listen to all of the laws and you follow all of the rules and also oh. serve God. Right, right, right. So you are free to do everything that the Bible tells you that you're supposed to do and also everything the law says to do and never ever go against that. You're free to do whatever you want as long as it's in the Bible and as long as the laws say so. And then, but other than that, you're free to do whatever you want. No, this is interesting though, because the way that he's trying to conceive of it, because this was a long time ago, so our ideas of demo democracy was sort of a joke at this point, right? Sure. But he's basically conceiving of the idea that the government is not supposed to exist to serve like the interests of a monarch or something like that, but it's supposed to be selfless and work for the people to promote justice. And instead, so like, he was trying to be like, the people should be yeah. subservient to the government, but the government also should not be like just the property of one guy. Right. Like it's supposed to be reciprocal. For the people, by the people. Yeah. Kind of a novel concept in the 1600s, though. But he had a tendency of liking to promote what he called justice and not so much into what's called general welfare. Oh. So he liked a lot of these like abstract concepts of liberty and freedom, but did not like a lot of things that had to do with helping the poor or helping people because they were using the evil natural liberty to do bad things. And that's why they were poor. But the people who are good, you can see now where he becomes the sort of black sheep of intellectual fathers of the American yeah. things, because you can see this all around today. Yeah, that's fair. You're throwing a lot of preamble terms at me. Mm -hmm. Liberty, general welfare. I've heard these before. Mm -hmm. And they also think that he was speaking in a situation that had to do with the fact that he wanted to keep the colony together and wanted to promote loyalty because there were some situations like where people like Anne Hutchinson tried to leave and make their own colony where she was like oh. very brutally suppressed for doing so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, basically like you know, a lot of laws that you would think that would fit that kind of thing of like a government that's actually doing stuff for people, which is not a thing that was normal at that time. So there's a law that he passed that said that heads of households had to make sure that their children and their servants got education and actually got public funds for teachers. Oh, that's good. We like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's 
basically the whole thing about what John Winthrop is. All right. That's that's who this guy is. What's your what's your read on him? We like him, we don't like him. He's complicated. He has a lot of ideas that are very, you know, forward thinking for the time that he was in. Uh-huh. But obviously, like this was a society that like not one that we would consider free and just in the way that we conceive of it today. But you All know, right. it's also primordial and judging historical figures can be, you know, sometimes it can be very cut and dry. Like, you know, Christopher Columbus was a monster and even oh, the people yeah. of his day thought so. Mm-hmm. But you know, people like John Winthrop, things get noodly and complicated. <laughs> That's fair. But that is a complete aside from what he's reporting on here. Yeah, this he's isn't del- here. That's, that's right. you're, you're, you're just dodging the question here. This is a guy, I don't care about this man. I don't care about this fellow. I care about the things that he saw and wrote upon about mm-hmm. aliens. Yes. And what he's reporting on I found very quickly, and this was the sort of like aha moment where I'm like, oh, this is actually an episode now, Uh. was that this light was probably not without its cultural context and probably not without its scientific explanation because what he's reporting on is something that is a very well-trod territory in English folklore and actually folklore around the world, which is something called- Oh, wait, hold on. Don't tell me what it is. Can we tell people- after the musical break. Ooh, a little cliffhanger okay. here. Yeah. All right. What's this mysterious light that they saw? So this is something that shows up a lot. They're all English or British at least. Uh-huh. And so they would be very well versed in this kind of folklore. But what they were witnessing was something called an ignis fatus, or as it was known in other circles, a will-o'-the-wisp. Will-o'-the-wisp. Which is one of the more fun words to say. It is fun to say. I'll give you that. I've heard of these. I've heard of these. I mean, these have popped up in, like you said, all sorts of myths and folklore. There's a monster version of it in D&D that you can play as a DM. Yes, yes. I I, I made sure to mention that, that it is a low level undead creature that is extremely deadly to first level adventurers, as I unfortunately learned uh, when I was running a first level adventure a while back. I believe one of the big bads from the show So Weird, you Ever watched so weird i have not was it a disney channel show it was like a horror of kids horror thing but it was like genuinely messed up i have a feeling that either canada didn't have disney channel or disney channel hit its peak a few years after my time so i never really got into disney channel stuff that was like my first uh interaction with uh will the wisp was i believe so weird they had a recurring villain that was a uh, will the wisp yeah it was genuinely like scary and then i as i grew up i was like oh these are like actual things from like folklore and stuff but i really don't know too much more about yeah. them i know that they exist i don't know what the whole history is behind them so that's what we're going to talk about we're going to talk about will of the wisps so fun but yeah so like the other word for it is ignis fatus which means foolish fire mm. ignis means fire fatus means either foolish silly or simple But the first recording of that is actually like probably in the 16th century. So pretty soon behind this person by a German humanist. So it probably comes from the German word Irrlicht, which means um, wandering light or deceiving light, which is probably a German version of the same thing. Mm -hmm. But then I only included this etymology for Ignis Fatus because apparently it was only translated to Latin from the German name because... They wanted to be in Latin, so it sounded like it had more intellectual credibility. (laughs) (laughs) That's really funny. (laughs) But in English, these lights have gone by lots of names over the years, including Friar's Lanterns, Hinky Punks, Hobby Lanterns, which is a reference to a hob, which is a sort of European house spirit, okay. you know, like a hobgoblin. Oh, sure. Or a leprechaun kind of fits this idea as well. Like hobs are sort of little... Or like the elves that fix your shoes, sort of like little spirits that live in your house. Is that where the term like hobby comes from? Is like a thing? Ooh, that would be a good question. I'm not going to look it up. (laughs) You can do that on your own time. But another name that these things go by is a jack-o'-lantern. Okay. Now this was news to me. So jack-o'-lanterns and will-o'-the-wisps are the same thing. Yeah. And I'll get into, I'll explain more about that a little bit later. Please do. So 
what these things are, what the story kind of shows over and over again is that they're these sort of ghostly lights that show up to night travelers, especially, yes. this is important to notice, uh, when you are close to either bogs, marshes, oh, or, or swamps. swamps. Yes. Okay. I'm recalling that information from earlier. Yeah. Yes. It looks like a little fire or a ball of light. And very often they are confused for UFOs. Mm. Or UAPs, as we've learned. The only thing that makes them different is that will the West tend to be closer to the ground while okay. UFOs tend to be in the sky. But that's the only major difference. Gotcha, gotcha. But other than that, they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. So a will the wisp is a thing that shows up a lot in English folklore, but also a lot of European folklore. Mm -hmm. They look like a little flickering lamp that uh, if you approach it is supposed to go away and move, you know? Oh, yeah. And that if you see one, it's trying to draw you it's from luring. a safe path and into a dangerous place. Yes. Another place where you might remember this is if anyone has read a book called The Two Towers or... If mm. you uh, watch the movie, there are some fires in the dead marshes that were trying to, you know, oh. trick people to go into the waters to see the, yeah. Wow, I never put that together. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, who knows more about English folklore than yeah. Tolkien <laughs> that's himself. That's true, that's true, that's fair. But basically these, uh, yeah, according to a lot of European folklore, these lights are supposed to be the spirits of the dead or their fairies or some other supernatural creature that is trying to trick travelers to basically go off their path and go to their deaths. Yeah. And they're used in like a lot of folk tales. And there's a lot of uh, different folk tales that have to do with the origin of Will of the Wisps that come from places like Ireland, Scotland, Wales, England, even Appalachia and Newfoundland. All over the place. Yeah. Sometimes they go by the name Will of the Wisps. Sometimes they go by the name of Jack o' Lantern. It really depends upon the culture that you're coming from. Mm -hmm. There's sort of two stories that have to do with the origin of them of those two specific names. The Will of the West name comes from a story about a guy named Will, who was this evil blacksmith who died and went to heaven, but St. Peter decided to give him a second chance instead of going to hell. Oh. But when he goes back, he has such a bad life that they basically doom him to wander the earth forever. Oh. And that the devil gives him a single burning coal to warm himself. And he uses it to lure travelers into the marshes. To what end? Just for fun? Just because he's evil. Because he's evil. He's just, he's got nothing else going on. Yeah. Ever, he's had such a terrible life. He wants everyone else to have a terrible life. Of course. Much more fun is the Irish version, which is a story about a guy named Drunk Jack. Love it. Love it. I believe, oh my God, this is like in my head. I believe this was the so weird version. The name okay. Jack comes out and I believe he did have like an Irish accent. I don't know. It's been like literally decades since I've seen this. I could be wrong. Okay. Tell me about it. The story of Drunk Jack or Stingy Jack. Basically, the devil comes to collect his soul, but okay. makes a deal with the devil and basically says, all right, I want to have one last drink before I go to hell. So devil, can you turn into a coin so that I can go buy one last drink? Oh, okay. But then, because Jack is clever, mm -hmm. he takes the coin and puts it in his pocket next to a crucifix, which prevents the devil from returning to his original form. Mm. And in exchange for his freedom, the devil gives Jack 10 more years of life. And then when that term runs out, the devil then comes to collect his soul. But Jack tricks him again by making him climb up a tree and then carving a cross underneath. Oh my God. <laughs> preventing him from climbing down. And then... In exchange for getting rid of the cross, the devil decides to forgive Jack's debt, but no one as bad as Jack could ever be allowed into heaven. So Jack is basically forced when he dies to travel to hell and ask for a place there. But the devil, pissed off at him at this point, denies him entrance into hell, but then gives him an ember from the fires of hell to light his way through the world, sort of as a lost soul forever condemned. And he places it in a carved turnip to serve as a lantern. Oh. Otherwise known as a jack-o'-lantern. Only That's pretty good. And then when it came to the Americas, when we found these things called pumpkins, we decided to put them in pumpkins instead. Yeah. I did look up So Weird to see. So Jack is just a character in So Weird. <laughs> so I think I just got that mixed up. But uh, the, the Will of the Wisp character is also Scottish, not Irish. So I apologize. But And I believe their name is Bree Cree Bree B-R-I-C-R-I-U. Pre-Cree-U. Does that pop up in these notes at all? No. Is that anything? Did So Weird lie to me? Yes. All right. That's fine. 
There's also another version of it that comes from, I don't really know the details of this, but I just wanted to point out how old this was because it was written about in one of the first modern novels written in Irish, Mm. which is a sort of language that Ireland is trying to bring back to life. Um, Sort of like Irish might sometimes be called like Irish Gaelic or something like that. But okay, that's cool. So this goes way back. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they're either ghosts But the other explanations that don't involve doomed souls rejected from hell, they're either fairies. Sure. It's another big thing in uh, especially Irish folklore. It's a big one. uh, But also ghosts or elementals. Sure. Elemental spirits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's other places where a will of the wisp can also be a sign of hope or a sort of goal that leads somebody on, but it's impossible to reach it because these things move away from you when you move closer to them. Right. You go towards it. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. But yeah, you never really get to it. It sort of Mm -hmm. lures you into where it wants you to be, whether good or bad. Yeah. Other thing, though, is that outside of like folklore, it's also shown up as a sort of like cryptid in a bunch of different places. You've got the St. Louis light, which is in Saskatchewan, the spook light in southwestern Missouri and northeastern Oklahoma. Probably the one that you might know is the Marfa lights. Marfa lights. I know that's a Texas thing, but I didn't. Oh my God, Tristan, Marfa lights is, that's what it was in so weird. (laughs) literally oh, okay that's what okay I've that got is the, so weird i've got the so weird wiki popped up <laughs> I'm in a tab right now yes it is literally that's where the will of the wisp and so weird came from it was it was the marfa lights okay but other ones show up and this is the part where things get interesting is that it doesn't just show up in places like europe there's actually uh things called the naga lights which is found in the area of mekong which is in thailand Ooh. but also you find it in place uh, like uh for all of you youper listeners out there uh see. there's something called the paulding light in michigan see i was always a lower peninsula i was always a lower peninsula kind of guy oh that's where i grew up kalamazoo baby I thought you were from South Carolina. I was like five or six years in Michigan and then like five or six years in South Carolina. They're they're equal to me. So we were talking about multiverses before we started recording. In the like Marvel multiverse, there's one where you stayed in Michigan and you became a uh, juggalo. Yeah, 100%. We're doing another podcast where you're like painted up and you're drinking Fago and just being like, whoop, whoop. (laughs) There's a multiverse version of me that's doing this same podcast, but it's- But you're a juggalo. But but it's, (laughs) but I'm a juggalo. And instead of debunking ancient (laughs) alien stuff, I just go, I just say what the ancient alien show says and I go, isn't that wild? Isn't that weird? It's just 50 episodes of me trying to explain how magnets work to you. (laughs) And I'm like, I don't get it, man, but I trust you. I don't know what juggalos are like. I don't have an impression of one. They actually tend to be a friendly bunch. That's awesome. They're Good just fans you. of Insane Clown Posse, which yeah. um, are weird, but they're weird, but ultimately kind of harmless. That's awesome. And they tend to be pretty fun to party with. Anyways, so yeah, Youpers, uh, they have the Paulding light. And also in Norway, you might uh, call this the Hasdalen lights. Mm. But the thing is, then I was like, all right, I got to span this search because now I'm finding Will of the they're Wisps or something like it in cultures around the world. everywhere, yeah. Yeah. For example, in Mexico, they claim that these are witches or what are Mexico called brujas. Ah, I've heard of that. Yeah. Or that um, that they are indicators to place where gold or hidden treasure has been buried. Ooh. And that you can only find it if you get the help of children. Okay. So sometimes they're called luches de dinero, which means money lights. All right. Or luches de tesoro, which is uh, treasure lights. Treasure lights. Yeah. That's fun. I like this almost like flip-flopping of sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. That's folklore. (laughs) That's folklore, man. You got to roll the dice on it. Yep. In America, the swampy area of Massachusetts, as we were talking about here, known as the Bridgewater Triangle, has lots of orbs. Okay. For example this incident that they were talking about in the show. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, but also in places like Louisiana, you might find something called uh, Fifole, or Fifole, Fifole, which says that the Fifole is a soul sent back from the dead to do God's penance. Wow. But instead it attacks people out of a sort of vengeance. Oh. But most of the time it just does harmless, mischievous things. Okay. But also it sometimes drinks the blood of children. This is a very confused legend. <laughs> this one is, <laughs> this one's sort of all over the place, isn't it? But basically the soul of a child that died yeah. before baptism is another explanation for it. But yeah, yeah, it oh. just, this is a Cajun little story. Sometimes it's mischievous. Sometimes it's evil. You know, a ghost. It's a ghost. I mean, they're just yeah. like people. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brazil, 
They have something called the boitata All right. or boijtata. I've never been able to pronounce anything in Portuguese well, so gotcha. um, we're just going to run. But basically, that's their version of the Will of the Wisp. Uh, it goes by a bunch of other regional names, but um, the name comes from Old Tupi and okay. means fiery serpent. Oh. Uh, and they believe that it is this snake. This actually shows up in a lot of them. So there's a snake that has fiery eyes. Oh. It's blind during the day, but at night it can see everything. Gotcha. So the lights are just the snake's eyes. Yes. Cool. So basically the legend is that the Boitata is a giant snake, usually an anaconda, mm-hmm. that left its cave after some sort of flood and in the dark went through fields preying on animals and corpses, eating its favorite things. And then it collected light from the eaten eyes and gave Boitata a fiery oh. gaze. It's not a dragon, but a giant no. snake. And in its native language, it's called the boa or emboi or, or emboa. And I'm like, you know, snake, because I know that the boa and boa constrictor, I think, comes from the same language. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. I like the idea with someone with a fiery or like a creature with a fiery gaze. It's very, did you ever watch Jackie Chan Adventures cartoon? No. No. The the pig talisman give, gave you heat beam eyes, which I always thought was Ooh. weird. All of the other stuff was like, yeah, the rooster one makes you fly and like the dog one makes you like feel very youthful and things. So they always fit. And then it was like, yeah, the pig can give you heat beam eyes, you know, like pigs do. And I'm like, oh, yeah. yeah, all right. Fair enough. Wasn't there just like a movie that came out that's supposed to be like about Superman's dog? Could like, is there one Crypto. about Superman's pig? It's <laughs> Superman's pig. Now that's a story I could get behind. <laughs> a whole Superman farm. Tristan, that's cute super farm. though. A super farm of like super just a animals? a Kryptonian farm that somehow founded itself on Earth that has like all the farm animals, but they're all Kryptonian? Yeah, we gotta write that. There was like a, a movie came out like last week, like a kid's movie that is about crypto, right? I mean, there was a crypto, that, there was a Super Pets movie that came it's out. Like an NFT like so. sort of deal. <laughs> oh, you're talking, Okay. Are we talking about different crypto related things? No, I was just making a, a joke. All right. But yeah, like it's a cartoon movie about Superman's dog. Yeah, the League of Super Pets. Yeah. So that they did a movie on that, right? Yes. Going back to South America. Yeah. In our Argentina and Uruguay, they also have a Will of the West thing called the Luz Mala or Evil Light. Pretty straightforward. And it's actually like a huge myth in their folklore there. And in rural areas, people are still really afraid of these things, about these evil lights. Mm, okay. Usually it's like a shiny ball of light floating just above the ground. Yeah. Another Will of the Wisp variant uh, is in Colombia, which is called uh, La Candeleja, which right. is basically the ghost of a vicious grandmother who oh, raised no. her children without morals oh, and they no. became thieves and murderers. So in the afterlife, the grandmother's spirit was condemned to wander the world surrounded in flames. So the grandmother raised her grandchildren without morals. Where were the parents during this whole situation? Who knows? Makes you wonder, right? Oh, yeah, where are yeah. the parents? Mm-hmm. Another one in Trinidad and Tobago, they have something called the uh, the Sukoyan, uh, which is apparently the word for fireball witch, which is a nice. great name for a metal band. Oh, yes, absolutely. Which is apparently just a witch that turns into fire at night. Cool. Yeah. And it, it's evil. It enters homes through any gap it can find and drinks the blood of its children or of its victims. Oh, fair enough. Another one is Alea, which is the Alea. name of a ghost light that shows up to Bengalis, oh. specifically Bangladeshi fishermen and also West Bengal uh, fisher. West Bengal is the Bengali part of India and okay. there's Bangladesh. So like that kind of area. Gotcha. And that the, these lights apparently make them lose their bearings and could even cause them to drown. Oh. If they if they go over these marches in front of it. another marsh thing, another Martian sort of bog yeah. thing. All right, I'm mm-hmm. interested. Another one that shows up in India is something called a chirbati, which is a sort of dancing light that shows up on dark nights. That's reported in a place called the Bani Grasslands. Okay, it's all over the place. Yeah. Even in Japan, they have something called the Hitodama, which is sort of a ball of energy. It's supposed to be a human soul or the Hinotama, which is a sort of be a ball of flame. It goes by a bunch of other names, but it's supposed to be balls of light that are associated with graveyards. But a show up in a bunch of places in Japan. Yeah. These are attributed to either uh, Kitsune, which are sort of like spirits mm-hmm. or yokai, which are sort of like Japanese demons. Okay. And they're sort of the same idea of like Will of the Wisps. Seeing one is supposed to be seeing the the marriage of two Kitsune and Kitsune are like kind of spirity foxy things. Okay. So another name of it could be a Kitsune Bai, which means a uh, foxfire. Oh, that's cool. Foxfire. Mm-hmm. Another good band name. Yeah. Foxfire. Good name for a browser. Um, 
it's almost there. Maybe if they tweak it a little bit somehow, it, yeah. it could definitely get there. Mm-hmm. There's some references also of this phenomenon showing up in some like medieval Chinese writing. In the Book of Dreams by polymath Shen Gua, there's a writing about the, during the reign of Emperor Jia Yu. Oh yeah, by the way, Mandarin speakers, I apologize in advance. Mm. Basically in the Jiangsu province, there was an enormous pearl seen, especially in the gloomy weather. At first oh. it appeared in the marsh and then disappeared in the lake. Oh. Yeah. So less of a light itself and more of a gleaming jewel. Yeah. In Sweden, there's a will of the wisp, which is uh, basically considered the soul of an unbaptized person who is trying to lead travelers into the water in hope that they'll be baptized. Oh, wait, in hopes that the soul will be baptized or that the people will be? Uh, That they will be baptized if they can like trick somebody into coming into the water. Oh. This feels very much like um, I've been playing a lot of The Witcher lately and this definitely feels like The Witcher is like very much steeped in like European folklore and this feels very much like something from The Witcher. Yeah, that's interesting. But there's also things that say that the Will of the Wisp is also a marker of the location of treasure. Uh, people in yes. Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, so sort of baltic area. But also in Ireland, there's the claim that this could also be the place where... I wonder if this is the origin of the treasure at the end of the rainbow. I wonder if that is in the same oh, family. Yeah, at the end of the... Le- maybe, maybe, maybe. It is interesting that, you know, depending on where what culture you're from, it could be good or bad. Like, if you're raised in a place where it's a good thing and then you go to a country where it's a bad thing, do you think that all the different Will of the Wisps will be like, I don't know. I feel like you get a you you should get a mulligan, right? Like if you're if you're in a different country and it's like <laughs> one sor- folklore mulligan. Yeah, sorry, I thought this was a good thing. You're trying to lure me to my death. That's different from where I was from. So yeah. like, just give me this one. I've learned my lesson. Appreciate I fell into the bog. I fell into no, the dead. bog. No treasure. Oh, that one's on me. You know, my bad. My bad. Yeah, it's sort of like how in European culture you wear white at a wedding, but like in many other cultures, wearing white is associated with mourning and death. And like Ah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff like that. There's even references to things like this in Australia, something called the Min Min Light, which can be seen in the Outback After Dark, which apparently has like, you know, origins even before the British showed up. Huh. Which is very interesting. Um, Then, of course, there's the people who are just like, oh, it's spaceships. Of course. (laughs) Yeah. Spaceships. But what this all points to, because there's so many different cultures, that that they're they're referring to something real. That's what I'm getting from it, right? Like you, you listed off all of these completely different cultures and countries and things where people have accounts of seeing these things, or at least have stories, have folklore, have myths about seeing these lights. It makes it feel like it it has to be something. It has to be like a real Mm -hmm. thing. Yes. And I imagine that it is a thing that is also probably responsible for a lot of UFO sightings as well. Okay. So there's various explanations as to what this phenomenon could be. One that was uh, verified that I just think was funny is that one flying ball of light was actually found to just be an owl that had a bright stomach. Oh. (laughs) Um, Which I don't think explains all of them, but at least explains one of them. There's probably not like a a horde of bright owls across the world. Yeah. 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 Another phenomenon that we've talked about, I think we talked about in our crop circles episode is ball lightning, which is sort of this phenomenon that we are sort of not sure if it's real or not. Like there's there's people talking about it being real. There might be some evidence of like video footage of it, Mm -hmm. but we haven't been able to replicate it in the lab really. Right. But basically, you know, ball lightning, a glowing ball of lightning that sometimes appears in a thunderstorm and also it's supposed to last longer than lightning usually does. But scientists don't understand it very well. We don't know if it's a real phenomenon or if it is like how it works exactly. It's very strange, very rare. Yeah, it's like the earthquake lights that we've talked about before too, where it's like, we don't even know if they're real and if they are real, like what even are they? And yeah. Mm -hmm. Another thing that could be an explanation for these will-o'-the-wisps are bioluminescence of various kinds. Like sometimes bioluminescence is called foxfire. Oh, well, there you go. Like for example, the honey fungus, when it forms white rot, actually emits this eerie glow oh. that could be mistaken for Will of the Wisps. Also, things like fairy lights, which is, you know, another kind of phenomenon like this, could be something like fireflies. Fireflies. Lightning bugs. Yeah, I get fireflies in my backyard during the summer. It is amazing. We get them around here, but you normally have to go into the mountains. They're not really much in the city. Ugh. I like having a backyard. Brag about it. No, yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, yeah, there's they're, they're literally flying 
things of like flickering, flashing lights. And there's so many of them that you might think that it's one luring you over, you know, even though it's multiple flashing. Yeah, that makes sense. But another explanation that has come close, I think that like this is the one that scientists think is the most likely to describe a lot of these different sightings and these phenomenon. It has to do with the fact that they all make references to marshes and swamps and bogs. Yes. Finally, we're talking about this. Yeah, because those are very particular types of biomes. They are places where there's a lot of still water and anything that dies in the water decomposes and gets kind of caught in it. So what people are thinking is that the decomposing organic matter starts to make gas. We know that that happens when stuff decomposes. It makes gas like methane yeah. or uh, diphosphine. All of these are sure. highly flammable gases. Uh -oh. Specifically, the ones that they, they, they come up with are phosphine, diphosphane, and methane, which all are byproducts of basically organic decay. So sure. it could be plant matter decaying in these bogs. Smelly dead gas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Specifically, phosphine and diphosphane can actually, when exposed to oxygen, spontaneously ignite. Oh. And if they do so... If there is methane in the area, methane is basically like natural gas, right? So yeah. if they were to spontaneously combust in an area that had like methane, which is also a you know decomposing matter byproduct, could cause like like little swamp fires, you know? Yeah. All right. So little are we talking? We're not talking like big explosions. We're talking like little bursts of fire. Yeah, like 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 bubbles almost, like bubbles yeah. of fire coming up. Yeah. Okay. And when some of these things burn up. They also produce a byproduct of phosphoric acid, which would create sort of like a viscous moisture. Okay. And sometimes these things are seen as having like a sort of like almost liquidy look to them that makes them yeah. not look like straight up fire. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so when I learned about this, I'm like, this is super cool. Like, I can't believe that I've been talking about this. I'm like, and then I realized that one of the ways that when UFOs try to denigrate skeptics, they'll be like, they just write this off as swamp gas. And I'm uh -huh. like, huh? Oh, this is what they're talking about. And this seems pretty legit. And it's like legitimate. I, so I was going to bring that up because I've heard this exact thing where it's just like, oh, no, you didn't really see that. It's just swamp gas or whatever. Literally, we were talking about Scooby-Doo at the beginning of this. Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island is one of the best animated films ever made. Had a sequel a couple of years ago where they went back to Zombie Island because the whole point with the first Zombie Island movie is that this time the monsters are real. And then they went back to Zombie Island and they found out that actually, no, the monsters weren't real and that they're, they were like hallucinating and things like that. And literally the explanation is swamp gas. Like that is are those that, the movies that you said are in the reverse order or the wrong order or whatever. No, the live action movies are in the wrong order. The okay. zombie Island and return to zombie Island are in the right order, except maybe one of them shouldn't exist, but it's hard to know. Okay. Yeah. They literally like Velma just says like, you know, what about all the other stuff, you know? And she's like swamp gas. So it feels like a, a hand wavy sort of thing that people throw at conspiracy theories, aliens, things like that. You know, if you see lights or whatever, ah, swamp gas. And then, but, in, but in, in this case, like it feels like a genuine reasonable explanation for this phenomenon. Yeah, it's called chemiluminescence. Chemiluminescence. Yeah, and also it's in the air, right? And so it's like burning gas in the air, yes. which means that if you were to walk towards it, you might disrupt the air and it might move and look like it's moving away from mm. you, which is another thing that kind of shows up uh, when people talk about these things. Yeah. And like, I feel like that's a really good explanation. <laughs> it's a really good explanation. I mean, the fact that people are saying that, you know, depending on the culture, they're saying it lures you to, you know, danger, harm, potentially your death. Like this stuff is literally in swamps, right? Not to mention like bogs, bogs and stuff like that, which are very easy things to get stuck yes. in and, uh, and, and drown in to the point where there's a bog in, I want to say England where they just keep digging up dead bodies in it oh, because no. like, 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 because they, it preserves dead bodies really, really, really well. So they're able to find like really old dead bodies. They're called bog bodies. I hate that they have a term for it, Tristan. <laughs> well, because they found so many of them and they're actually like, like they're like mummies almost. Yeah. But then I think also they learned that later on that some, a lot of these bog bodies were like human sacrifices. Oh no. From like pre-Christian Britain. To the jack-o'-lanterns. Or something. But like, like, I, like, I don't know. Bog bodies, that's a completely different, you know. 
maybe we'll touch on that in a future episode. <laughs> if there's a UFO thing about bog bodies, I'd be very amused. Very interested. Uh, let me find out where they are. They might not be in England or Britain. It might be, mm. yeah, peat bogs specifically. Uh, okay, so they're all over the place. Ireland, Denmark. It seems that a lot of them come from Denmark, which makes a lot of sense because Vikings did a lot of that human sacrifice stuff. Pete Bogg is actually the lead guitarist for Flame Witch or whatever the band was, Fireball Witch. Yeah, Fire Witch, yeah. Yeah, Fireball Witch. So that's interesting. Basically, all I need is he's saying is Bogs have some some funky chemistry going on in them and there's some flammable stuff and there's a good chance that if you fall into it, uh, bad stuff will happen to you because it's not exactly a fun place to be. Yeah. Bogs are not exactly a safe place. Don't, Don't play, in, play swamps. in swamps. Hey, everyone, real talk. Gather around. Just turning the chair around, sitting behind. So you decided to play in the swamps. <laughs> hey, we've had a lot of fun today. Don't play in a swamp. Don't play in any swamp. I don't know why I said a swamp. Don't play in any of them. Just don't do yeah. it. At the very least, you'll get leeches. You'll get leeches. And leeches really freak me out. So, And think about Tristan, you know? Think yeah, about him. Think about me being upset that you got bitten by a leech. That's what it's all about. I have like a legit phobia of leeches. Ugh. Well, we don't have to talk about it anymore. In fact, we don't have to talk about anything anymore. Because I think we've reached the end of the episode. Oh, yeah, because this that was the show. So it was Swamp Gas. Aliens the whole time. <laughs> so basically, to kind of put a bow on it, if we really want to do it, is that in another case, they basically did a thing that Ancient Aliens does all the time, which is they took something, stripped it of its cultural context, didn't realize that somebody writing in the 17th century uh, might be referring or talking about, first of all, a natural phenomenon, but two, a natural phenomenon that is interpreted through a lens of a deep European folklore that definitely John Winthrop would be aware of yes. or any of these discreet or sober people would mm -hmm. be aware of and would interpret through that lens. And that sometimes things are burning gas, which feels to me personally that sometimes gas burns in swamps might be a better explanation or might at least be a more believable explanation than that somehow some people have been able to travel faster than the fastest possible speed in the universe so that they can arrive on this planet and all they want to do is bug some fishermen in a yeah. swamp. Yeah, <laughs> and to, to sort of add to that too, like you were talking about before they had potentially no memory of, of certain events and they like lost track of time and things like that. Is swamp gas a healthy thing to breathe in or does it feel like it would sort of mess you up in a way? I don't really know. But I think that anything that makes a byproduct of phosphoric acid is not something you should be right. inhaling now. So that could possibly be another explanation there uh, to tie it back. in. Also, place. methane, methane for sure. Not something you don't, should be inhaling on a regular don't basis. Don't that in. Another great tip. Another great <laughs> don't tip. Don't huff gas, friends. <laughs> don't huff gas and don't play in swamps. You're, we're learning a lot today. And the sad part is it's over now. But the, it's not that yeah. sad because we're going to have another episode next week. And we've got so many more. If you're just listening for the first time, go back, listen to our back catalog. We've, we talk about so much fun stuff. We just tap some black mana now. So now you can uh, go and check out our other ones. We have one on a mountain. So you could tap that for mountain mana. Yep. We haven't done anything about forests or oceans or uh, what's the other one? Plains. So yeah. Well, hold on now, because... Well, we Bermuda Triangle, there you go, there's say, your blue. I was going to say, we did a Bermuda so, Triangle. I've talked about plateaus, is that something? I don't know what black, red, blue is, but there you go, Magic the Gathering people. There you go. You've gotten your reference. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for listening. Make sure to follow this podcast on Twitter at Probs Not Aliens for more updates about everything, especially as we're... We're into that spooky, I mean, are we in it or are we out of it now with this episode? I don't know. We're in the Halloween spirit. This will be coming out on October 25th, Ooh, so we are at peak, peak spooky, spooky season. season. Tristan, you do other stuff outside of this show. Somehow, miraculously, you find the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is what is the thing that you do? Uh, raise a baby. And then, but you oh, also do the, uh, other, <laughs> more, much more important, other than that, you do a much more important thing, which is called. Hey, if you want something spooky, step back, comments a lot on the very spooky state of the world today mm. and specifically the history that got us to this very spooky state. 
I'm making a video on Russia as we are probably closer than we've ever been in my life to nuclear war uh, over Russia. So Ooh. fun, good the times. The spookiest war. Anyone who knows anything about me and my feelings about nuclear <laughs> war, you could imagine that I am in a great emotional state these days. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Definitely not looking up any very rural Airbnbs at all. <laughs> but Scott, uh -huh. you are, if anything, more invested in Spooktober. Yes, it's the spooky holiday season, which means for me, it's Scoobtober. Uh, a thing that I thought I invented, but it turns out that Boomerang, the platform for classic cartoons, also is promoting. So the, we're going to get real litigious about it. I'm going to do a very violent lawsuit upon them to get the rights to Scoobtober back. But in the meantime, you can follow me at NerdSync. That's my YouTube channel, N-E-R-D-S-Y-N-C, where I am in the middle of making as many Scooby-Doo related videos as I possibly can. There's going to be some fun ones. I'm planning, uh, we'll see if I can get, get to do this. I want to make and try Every single disgusting sandwich in the Scooby-Doo franchise. That includes oh things God. like okay, anchovies so, and chocolate sauce and things like that. So, so that means you're going to have to call the hospital when yes. you try to eat like a 12 layer sand, like, like you know, one of them. Yeah, it's not going to be fun, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to try anyway. And then we've also That's got just content. like other stuff about the art of Scooby-Doo. If you want to learn more about the history and, and the creativity of the series, I've just got a lot of Scooby-Doo related videos. How do they make that walking animation and think, yeah, that's walking humans do. That's what the, the way that Shaggy is walks. The way that is, humans, humans walk yeah. this way. Humans. Yeah, they were animated by someone who has never seen a human walk, but has been told about it before. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want to see more Scooby-Doo content, NerdSync, that's where you can check out. And you know what you can also do is write a nice review on Apple Podcasts, leave us some five stars on Spotify or whatever. All of that stuff really does genuinely help us out, helps promote the show. And I got to get better at reading the names of reviewers on the show. I promise I'll get back on that. So leave us some great reviews and we would just really appreciate it. And tell your friends. Yeah, tell your friends because this show spreads through word of mouth. No recommendation algorithm for podcasts. So if you find a friend who you think would be into this stuff, Tell them to go to probvs.aliens.com because then you can find any platform that we're on and, and listen to it on there. And it's the true. YouTube channel's caught up with the podcast now. So excellent. So you can listen on YouTube as well. And I was going to say, you always say that there's no recommendation algorithm for podcasts, but I think we're creating one, right? Right now, we're saying the algorithm is you. You are the algorithm. Be the algorithm you want to see in the world. Be the algorithm you want to see in the world and recommend probs.aliens to all of your friends. Yeah, or enemies. Or enemies, that's true. Yeah, get, that's fine as well. We only determine that there's only one group of people who are not allowed to listen to the podcast, and it's Supreme Court justices. <laughs> Supreme Court justices is not allowed. Aliens are not allowed, but only because I think they would be really insulted by us saying that they don't exist. Well, we don't say you know they don't mean? exist. We just say they're not here. But they're if they here. are here... Yeah. yeah, that's true. We never said they don't exist. We just said that maybe they should stop taking credit for things that they didn't do. Huh, aliens? Mm -hmm. Think about that one for a second. Yeah, take them down a peg. Exactly. But I think that's going to do it for this episode. Until next time, my name is Scott Nicewander. And my name is Tristan Johnson. And remember, the truth is out there. <sighs> Probably. <gasps> Probably. Follow me. Don't have smart gas. Don't have, don't have smart gas. <laughs> I think I said smart gas. I did. Oh. You can huff smart gas. That's fine. Smart gas is great, actually. Highly recommend. <laughs> Command. <laughs> Command. <laughs> Command. <laughs> Command. <laughs> Command. <laughs> Command. <laughs>